Why exactly is this man the worst president ever? Hey, what's up? My name is Justin with Infuse Library. If you're anything like me, you probably find today's politics depressing and chaotic. And if I stopped someone on the street right now asking them who the worst president was, many people would probably name one of the last four or five presidents as the worst ever. So with such a good selection of questionable presidents to choose between, why do so many historians point to this guy as the worst president ever? I bet you don't even know his name. Now James is an unlikely fellow to get this terrible award if I'm being honest. Just take a look at his resume before he became president. Let's see, military experience? Check. Lawyer? Check. Congressman in the House of Representatives? Check. Senator? Check. U.S. Emissary to Russia? Check. Brokers a trade deal between the two countries? Check. U.S. Emissary to England? Check again. Senator again? Check. Secretary of State? Check. Mr. Buchanan's resume on paper at least was so impressive that you'd probably think he was the most qualified man in the entire country to even run for office. And you'd probably be right. The man had done practically everything, and with his political connections, he knew everyone worth knowing, especially in the South. And if you think about it, who better to calm the tensions between the two halves of the country but a northerner with southern sympathies? He knows how the government works, deep knowledge of the law, has friends in all the right places, and has a plan to save us from civil war. What a guy. But the final piece of the puzzle that tipped the election into his favor was the fact that he was just out of country during some really turbulent political debates. He never had to form a controversial political opinion on some of the really big hot topics of the day. While he was off busy being a political ambassador to England, hobnobbing with leaders of other countries, his political opponents were back home, self-destructing and getting their hands dirty over issues that divided the country. And because of all this, even though he wasn't necessarily the most famous man in the country that could have run for president, he appeared to be the better choice to the average American voter. So where the heck does all this go wrong? And what led one historian to say that Buchanan came closer to committing treason than any other president in American history? To explain all this, we should probably get to know James a little bit. On the good side, James was great at throwing parties. While that's really funny to say, it was actually a really useful skill. He was a people person that made friends relatively easily. This skill really served him well while being a diplomat in various countries. He was also a very generous guy, constantly helping out friends family and the poor. James Buchanan was peace-minded. He tried so many times to stop the Civil War from happening, and did prevent the USA from getting into a war with the British. Even though he was pro-slavery and law, he once bought some slaves in Washington to free them in Pennsylvania. If we took James Buchanan and put him in a more peaceful era of history, he might have escaped the historical criticism that he eventually got, and he would just end up being like a footnote, another average president not worth mentioning. The man even kept a pair of bald eagles as pets, which is awesome. But he unfortunately also had a lot of negative traits which led him to being a pretty bad president. James really wanted to please everyone, which is why he was so good at throwing parties. But unfortunately, being a people pleaser is just something you can't be while a president of the United States. Also had the tendency to flip flop on really important decisions and he would also contradict himself often. Another problem was that he worked really hard to appease southern states, even when doing so hurt the whole country. And finally, he just straight up didn't do things when everything was on the line. He was prone to inaction during crucial moments of American history. With the country slowly dissolving into civil war before his very eyes, Buchanan faced some really tough situations that would have challenged the very best of presidents. And it actually did, his successor, Abraham Lincoln. 1856, Election Day. James becomes the 15th president of the United States. States. And wouldn't you know it, just two days in, he suddenly has an influence over the trial of the century. Dred Scott v. Sanford. In case you're rusty on this case, let me give you a really simplified version of what happened. The whole case centers on this man, Dred Scott. He was an enslaved African American. He was taken from Missouri, his home state, which happened to be a slave state, by his owners into Missouri Territory, a free area. When his owners later brought him back to the state of Missouri from the free territory, Scott sued for his freedom. He said that he was legally no longer a slave because he had entered a free area. He started the lawsuit in the Missouri State Court, but eventually went all the way up to the Supreme Court, thus affecting the entire country. What a great opportunity to move forward as a country and start the process away from slavery, right? Well, no. Unfortunately, they took the exact opposite approach. The case was actually thrown out because it was decided that, number one, the case had no grounds. Number two, due to the color of his skin, he wasn't a citizen and never could be. Number three, because of this, he had no right to sue anyone in court. He, in fact, didn't have any rights. And finally, number four, just for good measure, one of the judges said that the Missouri Compromise was a load of BS because it limited slavery and exceeded Congress's powers under the Constitution. Now, of course, this is all greatly simplifying the whole thing, 
but I'm sure you're wondering what the heck this has to do with our brand new two-day-old president. Well, he actually influenced the court in that decision. He wanted them to make a definitive statement on the issue to solve it. He didn't single-handedly make it happen, of course, but he did influence it. Not a good look for a president. James was so naive that he said this case would permanently settle the issue of slavery. He would later find out that this case just made the situation worse. The South thought it was amazing and the North thought it was terrible. It strengthened the Republican Party because now they had an issue to fight for and then split the Democratic Party in two. This one case was a leading cause of the Civil War and we're only two days into his presidency. Let's take a look at another crisis that happened, something delightfully called the Panic of 1857. This was a financial panic that wiped out 1,400 state banks and 5,000 businesses. As with all financial panics, the root causes were pretty complex, stemmed from a declining US and international economy, a gold shipment via the SS Central America sank, making the situation worse, and then overspeculation handled the rest. Although the effects of this were pretty short, it it was devastating to big swaths of the country. Interestingly enough, this was only a heavy blow to the north. The southern economy was mostly farm-based and escaped most of the damage. So the country looks to the president to see if he has a solution to this mini recession. And President Buchanan took the bold stance that, number one, anyone who lost money did it to themselves by overspeculating, and number two, better luck next time. He withdrew all banknotes under $20 to reduce inflation. He then issued a statement to the state banks, basically some advice, and that was pretty much it. As you'll see a lot here, he took the hands-off approach. His motto was reform over relief. This was a first look at one of President Buchanan's tendencies, just sitting around and doing nothing during times of national crisis. Okay, so that was a pretty busy first year, but now it's time to move ahead to one of the most questionable parts of his presidency. James really, really wanted Kansas to be a state. There was Minnesota in 1858, Oregon in 1859, and then finally Kansas in 1861. But one reason why he was particularly eager for Kansas to become a state was that in all likelihood, it would probably end up being pro-Democrat, which of course was the political party he was a member of. But the main obstacle was that Kansas politically was kind of a mess. There wasn't one unified territorial government. And instead of restarting Kansas under one unified territorial government, President Buchanan just decided to back one of the factions the pro-slavery Lecompton government. And by backing them, I mean that he tried to rush the Lecompton Constitution to be recognized by Congress. But the issue was that there was also a rival Topekan government that voted against the Lecompton Constitution. But James didn't really care about the popular will of the people though. He pushed the Lecompton Constitution through Congress offering favors patronage appointments, and even cash for votes. James Buchanan was straight up bribing his way through Congress to pass this darn bill. Not a good look for a president. Unfortunately for James though, it only got halfway through Congress before being rejected by the House of Representatives, though it did pass through the Senate. His efforts at trying to bribe Congress didn't go unnoticed though. There was a movement to actually get him impeached. It didn't really go anywhere though, especially because he only promised to serve for one term. So as you've probably noticed, the issue that stalked him his entire term was the North-South unrest. I'm not exactly sure if he could have done anything to stop it from happening, but he sure helped it speed along. James didn't necessarily do one thing that made him into the worst president ever. It was a series of decisions that just showed that he didn't really know what the heck was going on and how his actions were affecting the entire country. One really quick example of this was the fact that he was eager for John Brown to be hanged, which just ended up making John Brown into a martyr for the abolitionist cause creating more strife. But even more concerningly, Buchanan knew that the southern states were attempting to break away, and he didn't take any action to stop it from happening. In his final speech to Congress, with the eyes of the country on him, James went out of his way to say the worst things possible. He mentioned that the states did not have the right to break away from the country. And then he immediately said that if they did break away, he and the whole federal government didn't have the constitutional right to stop them from doing it. He then blamed the northern states for the whole crisis because he said, by interfering with slavery, they caused the whole problem. His solution to all this was to suggest that Congress amend the constitution, affirming slavery, setting in stone the fugitive state laws, and popular sovereignty in the territories. The South hated it because he said that they couldn't secede, and the North hated it because he said he wouldn't stop the South from seceding, practically inviting them to do so. I don't want to give the impression that James wasn't trying to stop the inevitable. He was actively attempting to make the southern states happy and negotiate with them time and time again. His main technique was to try to say that we could pass a slavery amendment to the constitution to put the law on the side of the southern states. But none of that worked, no law was passed, and even if it was passed, it wouldn't have fixed the situation. Despite all of his efforts, state after state began to secede. 
and Buchanan actually had to replace some of his cabinet members as this was happening because they were actually from the states that broke away. So all of this brings us to Fort Sumter. This is a very, very important fort in the Civil War because it kind of just started it. Deep in Confederate territory, it became clear that it would eventually be taken by the southern states. Now, it's possible that the Union could have held on to this very important fort. The problem is President Buchanan didn't send any extra troops to fortify the fort until it was too late. Every day that he didn't send more troops and supplies, the problem got worse. He actually thought about surrendering the fort before it was even attacked, but then his brand new cabinet members that just signed on threatened to resign, so James decided not to. When he finally did send a ship with men and supplies, it was forced away by the Confederates. It was too late. Interestingly enough, Buchanan did not react to this form of aggression as an act of war and just continued to negotiate. But the crazy thing here is that right before the situation finally reached this boiling point, right before shots were fired, his presidential term was up and a relieved ex-president Buchanan finally left the White House. Okay, so was James Buchanan really the worst president ever? As with all top 10 lists, no one can really agree every single time. But James is consistently number two, number three, or number one on pretty much everybody's worst president lists that have been put out. And because of all of this, it just made his successor look that much better. I've got a video on that coming soon. This video was inspired by the book, Worst President Ever. If you want a more detailed look at the entire life of James Buchanan, I highly recommend it. I've linked that book down in the description below if you'd like to listen to it or read the whole thing. If you've enjoyed this video, you know what to do. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all next time.